God works in mysterious ways. I'll leave the light on still for a little bit in case anyone else is still coming in. So, so possible choices you could have uh, because thanks to Aristotle everyone's looking for eudaimonia human flourishing so what happens is that they break up into different ideas of what human flourishing is the very first one uh, that I, I usually put up is the cynic <coughs> and you could you could certainly trace the cynic Back to Socrates. And you could put Plato and Aristotle in here. And in some way, these are all going to influence these folks. But the cynic that we especially think of is Diogenes. And if you look at the cover of some of your books, see the school I'll show you the whole picture. So, so this is uh, the full picture here. I guess we might as well use that. That's not very good. Close that and go back. But so, so this is the well, that's the the whole picture. I speak English well enough. I know when you turn off the light, you don't close the light. So, so you might have seen this. It's on the cover of the, the big coffin bear text. Um, and it's painted during the Renaissance. So none of these philosophers actually look at, as far as you know, anything like, except they were ugly guys. You know, probably. So, <clears throat> so notice in the picture here, this is an arch in the Vatican Library. So it's a picture of a painting in a building in the arch. So, so all of this stuff is actually part of the structure. And notice here's a door. You can see that you know, this is in an arch of the, the library. And they've got lots of them. Every, every one of these arches, like the whole structure is all arches all down. And on the other end is another, of course, another one. All of these were pa painted by Raphael and his team, so it wasn't really just him. In fact, Raphael is right here. Uh, I'll show a better picture of it. So he's got his self-portrait and his assistant in this painting. Um, and so if we look at this, the very exact center of it is right here. So that's the vanishing point in the painting. Uh, and this is Plato, number one. And this is Aristotle, number two. And looking at them, we know that the model that he used for Plato was Da Vinci. If you have self-portrait, you know, portraits of Da Vinci, and Da Vinci was Raphael's mentor, so we know that that's Da Vinci. So that's him. And it's odd also because Da Vinci was known to be an Aristotelian, and yet he's got him portraying Plato in the picture. So that's kind of fun. Um, and the painting has uh, Plato dressed in sky colors, so blue for the air and red or reddish uh, 
for uh, um, fire, right? So, so he's wearing sky colors, plus he's pointing, you'll see his, his hand is pointing up, uh, and he's carrying a copy of the Republic. Aristotle's the one ne next to him in this actually looks younger, so it seems like that there was some interest there in making it clear that Plato was the older one. Although notice, this is Socrates, and he looks younger than Plato. That's totally wrong. So they're not all in age. Uh, you know, some of them were, were obviously dead by then. Um, but so Aristotle is pointing down relatively compared to Plato. And remember, he's an empiricist, so everything was taking go to nature. Uh, and he's dressed in earth colors, so water, blue, and brown for earth, right? So. And he's carrying the book uh, Nicomachean Ethics, so that's kind of cool. But this bum-like guy lying sprawled here is Diogenes. So he's the cynic. Let me see if I can get a better picture of. So this is. So here's, here's Diogenes, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Alcibiades, I'm not sure about the others. Uh, and so, so these are all just Raphael's uh, um, guesses of, of who these various people are. Uh, you, can, you can see uh, lots of different pictures on the internet, obviously, that you can see. So Epicurus is over here. With a, a fancy kind of wreath on his head. Um, Ptolemy, Euclid, Plotinus, we'll talk about tonight. Um, Alexander, now he's got Alexander as that guy. I would think that that would, would be Alcibiades. That's what I've seen in other pictures. So obviously we're guessing who these individuals would be. Heraclitus, uh, Parmenides, Pythagoras. Some of those are probably pretty, pretty certain based on the characteristics of, of what they're doing. But so the cynic that we usually think of is Diogenes. And Diogenes was fairly famous at the time. And his choice of, of eudaimonia, what eudaimonia means to him, is a life without any cares, worries. He's not trying to get up every morning and go you know, drink coffee and run off to work in the snow, so not for him. Uh, uh, and in fact, the word cynic literally means dog, where we get canine from, actually. Uh, so so, so um, it's the dog philosopher. The idea being that dogs were kind of respected. Remember, Socrates swore by the dog at one point, so it was a respected creature. Uh, but at the same time, left not like as a house pet per se, but as a wild dog that basically fended for itself and is essentially considered happy because right? it's basically just thriving without worry, without care. Uh, no family, really, that it has, you know, it's no wife that the wife is telling it what to do. Sorry, but you get the idea. So that he's a bum, basically, right? Homeless dude, basically. Uh, so, so, you know, if you're thinking of the homeless people that are homeless because they want to be homeless, right? Not, not homeless because they're mentally ill, confused, have no place to stay, no one cares for them, or that kind of problem, very different. Uh, but for the individual that wants to be homeless because he doesn't want to bother with all that's, that's. Diogenes has some famous uh, uh, kind of interactions uh, so Alexander comes up to Diogenes, supposedly with uh, one of his officers, Ptolemy, and they, they see Diogenes lying there. Alexander's all thrilled to meet the famous philosopher. So he comes over to Diogenes and he says, I am Alexander, is there anything I can do for you? And Diogenes looks up at him, because he's walking his life, right? He says, you can step out of my son, and Ptolemy, going to be the end of Diogenes. But Alexander looked at him and said, you know, if 
I were anyone else besides Alexander, I would want to be Diogenes. It's his choice. It's a famous little scene. But Diogenes was very weird. Uh, he liked to do whatever he felt like, and he would stand on pillars. Or we were out of power in the other room, so they like, moved us over here. Uh, but so um, he liked uh, basically spouting off philosophical wisdom by standing on a pillar for the begging bowl, because you got to eat. So his version of the cardboard sign, I suppose. They didn't have cardboard yet, so imagine they have to do something. But he was pretty gross, too, because if he felt like masturbating, he would do that, even in public. I always mention that, because it really grosses me out. So, so basically, he was, do what you feel like, you know, that kind of thing. Pretty weird. So if we think in terms of kind of the logic of these different philosophical choices, the cynic is the one that has the least concern for society. It's all just me and me even to the extent that I don't need it. Apparently went to a, a well to get a, a drink and he took out his cup from his rucksack and dipped it in the water and a little boy came over and scooped some water with his hands and Diogenes realized he didn't need the cup so he threw the cup away. He didn't have to have the cup. It's meant to extra. Why carry a cup? Don't need to come. Um, so cynics, we don't have any uh, writings uh, reflecting their point of view in the text. I suppose you can find some. Otherwise, it'd be a magical marker. So the cynics were one. But then the next one is kind of more interesting. And we have some text by Epicurus, mostly um, kind of like bullet comments. Don't do these things, you know, kind of a manual uh, how to live, basically, uh, in a way that would make you happiest. Uh, and Epicurus, but his philosophy ends up being referred to as Epicurean. So you probably have heard of that, Epicurean usually associated with really fancy restaurants where you eat exorbitantly crazy food for very high prices and get sick afterwards. Um, which is odd because Epicurus is against that kind of thing. So, so the odd thing about Epicurus is that it seems like most of the people that kind of latch on to his philosophy completely misinterpret his overall sanity goal of, of ha having a happy life but a sane life. You know, so you know, it's fun to have sex and things of that sort, but you don't go to an all-night orgy because who knows, it's not good for you. You'll, you'll get beat up maybe, or you'll end up with diseases, or you know. So, so that's not the kind of thing that he, he proposes. Um, but he is interested in being happy. So for him, uh, eudaimonia is flourishing in the sense that you're satisfying all your bodily wants and happy. You're, you're basically physically happy. But the Romans did overdo that. They did literally uh, take his philosophy, and especially the very wealthy, famously made absolutely horrible choices out of that. One of the uh, ones I, I think is especially well done is um, the scene so this is a scene from Fellini's Satyricon It's not going to help if it's all in Italian, is it? So, satiric 
Lucan is a Roman, Roman set of stories about two boys that travel through various parts of Rome. He's one of them. And so they, it's basically just these disconnected scenes giving you an, an idea of what the life in Rome was like during Nero's period. Um, so Trimalchio is a rich man. He has a hotel in every town. You can tell because it says Trimalchio up on the top, and it's all gold. And that's Trump. Sorry. <laughs> Hedonism, yes. Um, uh, hedonism is the belief.